Uh, while we're waiting, I'm just going to say, if you're taking pictures from your phone, it would be really great if you could tag GW Public Health. <laughs> and no flash. And no flash, please. <laughs> Except for the, the professional photographer here. He's the only one allowed to have flash. Also, please tag um, GWPHSA. They say, never meet your heroes, probably because they might fall short of your expectations. But today, I can say that I met my public health hero, and he did not disappoint. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Prabha Raghavan, an MPH candidate and the Public Health Student Association president of the Milken Institute School of Public Health. It is truly an honor to be able to welcome you to our 14th annual South Bee Lecture in Comparative Health Policy during National Public Health Week. We're all excited about our keynote speaker. Still, before that, I want to spotlight those whose generosity allowed us to host him today. I'm privileged to introduce to you Dr. Richard Southby, a founder and Dean Emeritus of GWSPH and a member of GWSPH's Dean's Advisory Council. Dean Southby's respected public health journey began, began in his native Australia before leading him to the GW family in 1979. Since then, he has held numerous faculty and administrative positions, including Executive Dean and Distinguished Professor of Global Health in the Office of the Provost. He was also the longest serving chair of the school's Department of Health Services Management and Policy. Dean Richard and his wife, Dr. Janet Southby, have made extraordinary philanthropic commitments to GWSPH that have helped us bring distinguished speakers to our campus since 2009. On behalf of our students, I want to thank you, Dean and Dr. Southby, for your leadership and unwavering commitment to GWSPH. Everyone, please welcome Dean Richard Southby. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for that very nice introduction, Prabha. It, it's my great pleasure to introduce the president of the George Washington University. Mark Wrighton, Mark Wrighton is the president of the George Washington University, and prior to this appointment, he served as the chancellor of the Washington University in St. Louis from July 1995 through May of 2019 after which he was appointed Chancellor Emeritus and the inaugural holder of the James and Mary Wirch Distinguished University Professorship. Earlier in his career, he spent over two decades at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he was Professor of Chemistry and Provost. It's my great pleasure to introduce to you President Mark Wrighton.
Thank you very much. It's historic uh, to have this special lecture with our distinguished speaker. Uh, I'm very thrilled to be here to learn the lessons that will be communicated shortly. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Dean Southby uh, for his leadership here at GW. Um, he didn't really elaborate very much on what was said about his career here. But over lunch, I learned that he was the key person in founding a school of public health at George Washington University. And this is a signal achievement because today, this school is the only school of public health in the District of Columbia and is a premier research intensive school that is making great contributions, not only locally, but nationally and internationally. Thank you very much for your great leadership. <laughs> this annual lecture, of course, brings distinguished people to the university, and Dr. Fauci is premier among them. We're very fortunate that you could spend time with us, and we're grateful for all that you have done in the last several years. I would say that no person in a public position has done more for public understanding of the pandemic than you. And I'm really grateful for all that you have done to shepherd the nation through this historic challenge. Thank you very much. In the fall, this school celebrated its first 25 years. And um, we have long and strong traditions here in advancing human health. I would like to note that our School of Medicine is celebrating this year its 200th anniversary of its founding, one of the oldest schools of medicine in the United States. I'm really proud of the opportunity to work with Dean Barbara Bass of the School of Medicine, and I'm looking forward to the celebratory activities later this year. But here at the School of Public Health, no one has made more progress for this school than Dean Lynn Goldman. She is a, a spark plug, and <laughs> she is hugely energetic, and she is a powerful advocate. I know that there are many here who are associated with the school directly as students, staff, faculty, and she is always, always advocating for the school and wanting me to push every resource that is available. <laughs> but, but I have to remind her that I have other children too, <laughs> and I love them all, but this school has emerged as the research powerhouse that it is under her 13-year tenure as Dean. Please welcome Dean Lynn Goldman. Thanks to you, President Wrighton. I'm thrilled that you're joining us today to continue our celebration of our 25th anniversary and the celebration of National Public Health Week. You have been a tremendously effective and deeply empathetic president and I'm grateful for the time that we've had together here at George Washington University. I should add for Dean Bass, who is here, happy birthday as well to the School of Medicine and Health Sciences. 200 years, my God. We can't wait for the celebration. <laughs> we have had the... <laughs> so I have had the honor of introducing... Um, uh, the Southby Lecture for a number of years, but truly this 14th annual um, lecture 
it's, it's the first time that our lecture has been what, what I would say is a household name. Um, he has had a measurable impact on me, each of you, and likely everyone on this planet. Dr. Fauci has served under seven presidential administrations at the intersection of traditional medicine, public health, and policy. He has often found himself at the center of our nation's response to threats of emerging infectious diseases, ranging from HIV AIDS to SARS to Ebola to Zika virus and to COVID-19. Having served for 38 years as the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, Dr. Anthony Fauci has led the U.S. government's response to some of the most devastating infectious disease outbreaks in modern times. However, it is not only his tenure in this capacity, but the empathy and attentive nature of his approach that makes him a remarkable leader. Some would say it's his training as a clinician, the marvel of a wonderful bedside manner. One could point to the generations of leaders who he has mentored and who themselves are making major impacts on health and medicine in the United States and globally today. One could suggest that it began even earlier as a point guard on the Regis High School base basketball team, which taught him to listen to others, to orchestrate the offense, and shoulder responsibility under extreme pressure. We saw that every single day during the worst months of the COVID pandemic. I would note that his tremendous empathy and ability to listen to patients and communicate in ways that people can understand is a part of what he's been able to contribute to our country. I'll never forget how in the early 1990s, at the beginning of the HIV AIDS epidemic, when protesters from ACT UP and, and others, hundreds of people, entered the NIH wanting to be heard. Rather than being dismissive, rather than putting up barriers, Dr. Fauci gave them an audience, and in that process, he actually learned from them. He is highly attuned. He connects to people in a way that shows humanity, that shows care for every single human life, and shows respect. Regardless of how he became this effective and extraordinary as a scientist and a public health servant, we are truly fortunate that his journey led him to science and medicine and ultimately public health. Every organization with whom I'm affiliated has honored Tony Fauci. The AAPHA, the ASPPH, the National Academies, George Washington University. I'm not going to give the entire list, but I think it's clear that he is the nation's leading science and public health voice, and he was there for us through some of our darkest moments. He is a true national treasure. Dr. Fauci has been an incredible supporter of the George Washington University, our School of Public Health, our School of Medicine and Health Sciences. He has graciously been there for us for our Center for AIDS. He has been one of the people who has been willing to join with our faculty and our students to share his experiences with them over many, many years. After 54 years at the National Institutes of Health, he is embarking on the next chapter of his remarkable to career. Welcome back to GW, Dr. Tony Fauci. We are thrilled that you could be here. So thank you so much, uh, Dean Goldman, for that very, very kind inf introduction. I want to thank the Dean Southby and Dr. Southby for sponsoring the lecture. And uh, President Wright, and thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I didn't realize, I thought I was old, but Dean Bass, you don't look 200 years old. <laughs> anyway, um, I think, there we go, we're all right. So as you, as you heard from the introduction, I'm gonna be talking about lessons learned from the COVID-19 and lessons regarding pandemic preparedness and response in what we're already in right now because we're not through with this yet, as you'll see as I get into the, into the talk, but also for the pandemic preparedness and response for future challenges. So my first slide somehow got missing, but then again, 
I thought the government was bad, but this is just... <laughs> Anyway, the first slide was the title that said uh, what, what I was going to be talking about. But before I get into the lessons learned, what I want to do is just give you really a small thumbnail sketch, uh, literally in a, in a couple of minutes, of what got us to where we are to really talk about lessons. So let's just look historically, turn the clock back to that very important time of January of 2020 when a number of new cases of an unusual pneumonia were reported out of the central Chinese city of Wuhan. And very, very quickly, it was identified as a novel coronavirus as the cause of that. <clears throat> you remember now, and I'll get back to that in a moment, that in 2002, another novel coronavirus was responsible for SARS-CoV-1 that also emanated out of a situation in the southern part of China, Guangdong province, that led to a mini outbreak of 8,000 cases and 8, 781 deaths. Very quickly, the sequence was posted on a public database literally the next day. And from that, as I'll get to in a moment when I talk about the scientific response, that led to a chain of events that led to the interventions that we currently had. Now, historically, if you look now at the phylogenetic tree, and for those non-virologists in the audience, uh, this looks a little complicated, but it's simple. What it tells you is that in red font are the human coronaviruses, and the four that you see on the alpha and the lower eight o'clock portion of the beta coronaviruses were common coronaviruses. So we've had experience with coronaviruses before. But look at SARS-CoV-2, how it clusters near bat coronaviruses, as well as its proximity to SARS-CoV-1, and then MERS, which we experienced in 2012. Again, the first travel-related cases, as you all remember, was in January 20th, of 2020 and reported in January 2021, a case in the state of Washington, which was a travel-related case from Wuhan, China. Let's fast forward a couple of months, and in March of 2020, the WHO declared it a pandemic involving up to 118 uh, cases, 118,000 cases in over 100 countries with 4,291 deaths. It's sort of interesting and somewhat ironic, isn't it, that they're declaring it a pandemic, thinking that it's already a pandemic with 5,000 cases. And now, as you know, as I'll get to into a moment, if you look at where we are right now, in March of 2023, there are over 760 million cases that are reported globally, likely a lot more close to 7 million cases reported uh, globally, likely at least twofold more than that. A little bit more accurate projection is what we have here in the United States of 104 million cases. That clearly is an underestimate because how many people in this room have been infected, moderate symptoms, got a positive test and didn't report it to anybody but your private physician? So that number is an undercount. It's probably more like 250 million, I think. Now, report, or maybe less, 200 million. But the thing that is probably the accurate number among that is the amazing number of 1,125,000 deaths in this country, making it the worst pandemic of a respiratory illness in well over 100 years since the now iconic pandemic of influenza in 1918. Okay, so I'm gonna pick out 10 lessons. When I started thinking about lessons, there were about 20, 25 lessons and counting, but I thought that rather than bore you with a rapid fire 20, I would pick out 10 that I believe are the most compelling that we can actually relate to and also learn from those lessons. So. Let's start off with the first one, and that is expect the unexpected when you're dealing with pandemics, because every pandemic is really different. 
And there are three elements of this that really surprised us and was responsible for what I referred to as the moving target of this outbreak, which made communication with the public very difficult. And I'll explain what I mean by that later. First of all, we were dealing with a highly mutable virus that evades immunity therapies and vaccines. Now, with influenza, you see that over years to decades. We've never seen it within the context of a single outbreak. So think about that for a moment. This is within a single outbreak. Now, again, this is, uh, I was going to say a confusing slide, but it's actually a beautiful slide, I think. <laughs> and on the left-hand part of the slide is the ancestral strain, the original Washington WA strain. And notice the variants that I'll get into in a moment that spread out from those, alpha, beta, delta, gamma. But take a look at Omicron, how different from it all Omicron is. And that's what hit us, as you know, in November of 2021, where we had an outbreak of Omicron. And since then, since, Jan since November 2021, we have had multiple sublineages of Omicron. So we have been in an Omicron era since November of 2021, which is bad news and good news. The good news is that it actually, in fact, gives you enough cross-reactivity that infection with one maybe doesn't protect you against infection, but it protects you against severe disease. The bad news is that it is a very different virus and led to a big burst of infections. Each of those variants had an increasing growth capacity and was able to escape immunity of monoclonal antibodies. And remember, as we went from left to right up the stairs of increasing growth capacity, monoclonal antibodies that were developed and effective against an alpha or a delta were no longer effective against XBB 1.5 or the new ones that are coming out most recently. This has led to spikes of infection and death that correlated with the new variant. So I just showed you the stepwise going up of different variants. And this is what looks like clinically of the seven day rolling average of cases in the United States from March of 2020, when we declared it a pandemic until just literally a few days ago when you had a diminution now, we're in a much better place than we were before, and the deaths are the same thing. The deaths and the cases paralleled the new variants as they came. Now, that makes it very difficult because what we can't do and have not done, we've done a little bit of it, is to play whack-a-mole <laughs> with the various variants because if we had looked for a new vaccine for each of these, we would have been playing whack-a-mole about every five or six months. Now, right now, it's very clear that we went from 800 to 900,000 cases a day down to a much lower level, and we went from three to 4,000 deaths a day to now down to around three or 400 deaths per day. So, we're not out of the woods yet because remember, one of the things we are concerned about, just the way Omicron came out very, very different, it is conceivable, how likely, I do not know, but it is conceivable that we will have something like this, a brand new variant where we're sitting around thinking that everything is behind us, which right now everybody wants to believe, uh, un understandably, that everything about this outbreak is behind us, but we don't know that. And when you say that, you don't want to scare people. And that's not meant to it. But we just better make sure we stay prepared because we can get a different outbreak. OK. Now, the next thing, and we're still in lesson one, but lesson two, three, four is going to go much, <laughs> much, much more quickly, I promise you. OK. One of the things that is really a game changer for COVID is the fact that unlike any other respiratory virus, about 50 to 60% of all of the infections came from an asymptomatic person, either someone who never will get any symptoms or who is in the pre-symptomatic stage. So 
For the non-virology, epidemiology types in the audience, why is that important? It's important because the syndromic approach to a respiratory disease gets turned over on its head. How do you do contact tracing of someone who doesn't have any symptoms? It makes it very, very difficult to do. And that's what we were facing with, and that led to some changes in the approach towards masking, when if you only ask a person who's symptomatic to wear a mask, or only test someone who's symptomatic, you are gonna miss a lot of people in that blanket. And then the other thing that came a bit later was a realization that unlike influenza, which is mostly droplet transmitted, this is a virus that's transmitted by aerosol. Now, what does that mean? Aerosols are particles that float in the air and they come out when you breathe and when you talk. So you don't have to be sneezing and coughing to let out aerosol. And that's the reason why people who are infected in a room, when nobody has a single symptom, that's when you could transmit. Okay, now, lesson two. This is important because we need to act early and rapidly with public health interventions and countermeasures when we're dealing with a virus of pandemic potential. It is not linear, it is, it is linear at first. Look at from left to right. And what happens when the pandemic explodes, it goes from linear to exponential. Now, if you're having a virus that you know has pot pot pandemic potential, then anticipate it will ultimately be exponential. That leads to a relationship with another lesson regarding transparency, because remember, some of you have corporate memory in the audience, is that we were thinking, based on what the Chinese were saying, that this was a very inefficiently transmitted virus. Remember that? And then it was, well, maybe it's transmitted pretty efficiently, and then, Holy mackerel, it's transmitted really efficiently. So if you had known that early on, your preparation and your response would have been different. Okay. That's the reason why the G7 has an aspirational goal of literally within 100 days being able to have the threat identified and interventions available. Now, that's very aspirational because as I'm going to show you in a bit, we got a vaccine out, but we got it in the shortest time ever. But not as short as 100 days, but 100 days is not out of the question. Lesson three, and this has to do with lesson two about knowing that you're dealing with a virus of pandemic potential. Global information sharing and collaborations are essential, and that is for everything. That's for surveillance data, for patient samples, for research reagents, for real-world clinical data, for genomic data, for viral isolates. We have multiple mechanisms of doing that. We have preprint servers like MedArchive. We have BER resources, which is the ability to get isolates and reagents. We have any of a number of ways to share information and share specimens. That is absolutely critical because any lack of transparency is gonna slow down the process. And when you slow down the process, people die. So even though this might look like something that isn't that important, it's extremely important. Lesson four, you've gotta leverage existing infrastructures. In this case, again, some of you in the audience remember, 38, 35, 37 years ago at NIAID, in anticipation of the need for clinical trials for antiretroviral drugs and for vaccines and for prevention, we built the largest clinical trial network in the world. And we built it with the HIV vaccine trials network, the HIV prevention trials network, the AIDS clinical trials, and the Infectious Diseases Clinical Research Consortium. When COVID hit, if we had to start from scratch with a clinical trial infrastructure, it would have taken us years. So how did we go from a sequence that we knew on January 20th to the beginning of a clinical trial 65 days later? We did it 
because we leveraged the existing clinical trial structure and we called it COVID Prevention Network or COVE-PN. Some of you may recognize that. And why it is important? Because COVE-PN, if you look at this map, has sites literally throughout the entire world. And as when we get into, into the vaccine component, it was in these sites that we were able to have clinical trials involving tens of thousands of people literally overnight by merely converting a clinical trial network for HIV into a clinical trial network for COVID-19. Lesson five. This is one I want to spend a few minutes on because it really is the core of one of the great successes that we had with COVID-19. And that is prior scientific advances enabled the rapid countermeasure develop. So I wrote a commentary in April of 2021, the story behind COVID-19 vaccines. And it's a beautiful story of science. What it tells us that the speed and efficiency in which these highly efficacious vaccines were developed would do to an extraordinary multidisciplinary effort of basic preclinical and clinical science that had been underway, under the radar screen, out of the spotlight, literally for decades before the unfolding of COVID-19. So when we talk about how quickly we responded within days, well, on the far side of that were decades of research. So I want to introduce this in two separate buckets. One is vaccine platform. What do we mean by a vaccine platform? A vaccine platform is the type of vaccine that you use. It could be killed vaccine, live attenuated, recombinant DNA, viral vector. That's the platform. The imagen is what particular disease you're dealing with. Polio, measles, mumps, hepatitis, Ebola, MERS, etc. It was the individual scientific approach on both platform technology and imagen design that led to the success. Let's look at platform technology. I don't want to go into all the different platforms. The one that obviously was the game changer was the mRNA technology. mRNA technology was not born in 2020. Katie Carrico and Drew Weissman were working on this literally for a couple of decades before. And what they did was an eloquent scientific experiment in which they took an mRNA molecule, which when the body sees RNA, it thinks it's a virus, so it immediately de degrades it. So how do you get an RNA, an mRNA virus vaccine to be used as a vaccine? What they did for years worked on modifying the molecule so that the part that triggers an innate response is no longer there. So the body sees the mRNA and doesn't think it's a virus and allows it to then code for the protein that becomes the imidogen. What about the imidogen? The imidogen was based on an interesting merging of interest in HIV and in COVID. And let me explain how that came about. It came about at the Vaccine Research Center at the NIH, which was part of NIAID. And what it was is that a group of investigators, and I circled two people in red. The one on the top, the six foot five guy, is Bonnie Graham. And Bonnie Graham came to the VRC interested in respiratory syncytial virus, even though he is also an expert on HIV and now an expert on COVID. In the lower left is Peter Kwong, who's a structural biologist whose major interest is HIV. So for years, Peter was working on trying to stabilize the structure of the HIV envelope trimer using cryo-electron microscopy and structure-based vaccine design. Fortunately, it was eloquent science. Unfortunately, we don't have an HIV vaccine yet. However, down the hall from him was Bonnie Graham, 
who was trying to develop a respiratory syncytial virus vaccine. And what they found out, that the immunogen, so that when a virus, and, and I know many people in the audience know this, but for those who don't, when a virus meets a cell, cell virus, this is the prefusion form. When it hits the cell, it fuses and its conformation changes. It was found out that the prefusion immunogen really was a great immunogen. It induced a really good immune response. The post-fusion was not as good an immunogen. The problem is, is that the prefusion was very unstable and you couldn't make it into a vaccine. So what they did is they used the structure-based vaccine design and look at the paper on the left. The authors are Bonnie Graham and who? Peter Kwong. They got together and they used that technology to be able to stabilize the F protein, which is a protein that's the immunogen for respiratory syncytial virus, in its prefusion form by using some particular mutations to stabilize it. And as you probably know right now, a respiratory syncytial virus has been recently approved and, or will be in the process of being approved based on this. So then they said, well, wow, maybe we can use that in coronaviruses. So when MERS came along, they started to develop a vaccine against MERS and they used the same mutations to stabilize the prefusion spike protein. So everybody in the room knows now the spike protein is the protein for COVID. Well, they stabilized that in a really immunogenic form, but mares never turned out to be a global threat, but they knew what the mutations were. So when COVID came along and on the 20th of January, I mean, excuse me, on, on January 10th, 2020, when I got Barney Graham and I got Peter Kwong in our conference room in Building 31 on the NIH campus, we said, Barney said, just give me the sequence and I'll get an imidogen in a few days. And he did something in a few days that normally would have taken years. Why? Because of the story that I just showed you. And as a matter of fact, if you look at this slide, the platform is in the middle, the mRNAs, but look at the right-hand part, the S, 2P, that's two proline mutations in the S part of the, of the spike. And that is the immunogen that's used in virtually every single vaccine. Now, what about the time frame? This is really interesting. I, I, I spend more time than the other lessons because I love this lesson. <laughs> okay, as I mentioned, five days after the sequence was made available, we started the vaccine production with Moderna. 65 days later, we were in a phase one trial. 139 days later, in a phase two trial. 198 days later, in a phase three trial. That's ridiculous. <laughs> that never happens in vaccinology. And then 11 months later, after testing it in tens of thousands of people in the clinical trial network in lesson number four, we had a vaccine that was going into the arms of individuals that was safe and 95% effective. Now, let's compare that to other vaccines. So the time to development from the time you recognize a pathogen, it's sort of a little bit silly, like typhoid took 105 years, all right? <laughs> so polio took 47, pertussis, rotavirus, and you go all the way down and look at the difference between how quickly. Now, the reason I show this is one, it's of scientific interest, but two, do you imagine how many more people would have died if it had taken four or five years to get a COVID vaccine? That is the lesson of all lessons to support biomedical research, but also if you look at the effect for one year from December of 2020 to November of 2022, We've saved, we've averted 3 million deaths, 18 million hospitalizations, 120 million infections, and a healthcare cost of a trillion dollars. And I can tell you, we didn't spend a trillion dollars on the basic research to do that. It was measured in tens and tens of millions of dollars. 
And because of that, Science Magazine voted this, appropriately so, in December of 2020, the scientific breakthrough of the year, and even the lay press realized the importance of this, where Kizzy Corbett and Bonnie Graham, who did the Immunogen, and Katie Carrico and Drew Weissman, who did the platform, were named the Time Heroes of the Year, and very, very deservedly so. Now, we also, before I leave that lesson, we realize now that we must make a commitment to the vitality and renewal of the biomedical workforce that's essential. Fields traditionally associated with human infectious diseases, and we're right here at a school of public health, so you're all part of this. Related fields such as ecology, evolutionary biology, the social sciences, and the physical, chemical, mathematical, and computational sciences. We need to keep training people so that we have more Bonnie Grahams, more Drew Weissmans, more Katie Caracos, and more Kizzy Corbett's. Lesson six, prototype and priority pathogen approach. What do we mean by that? Priority pathogen means you decide ahead of time what pathogen really is of pandemic potential, and you already start making interventions for that. That's what a priority pathogen is. The WHO blueprint has already picked out some of these, and you recognize them. Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever. NIPA is always a threat, sitting right there, getting ready to be an outbreak. CEPI, an organization that's an international organization, has also put together a priority pathogen. However, what I believe is the most important approach would be to do a prototype pathogen approach. What do we mean by that? That means that you build on prior experience within a family of virus. There are tens and tens of families of viruses, but among them, about seven or eight fall into the category that within those families are pathogens that are much more likely to be of pandemic potential. So what you do is you use the experience that you have in each of these families to then extrapolate it to being able to respond rapidly. So this was an approach that we wrote about like now five years, six years ago, but the real brains behind the prototype pathogen was Barney Graham, who came to me one day and said, Tony, you know, we really need to start working on this approach. And I said, what, what is this approach? And he said, let's take seven or eight families the coronaviruses, the orthomyxoviruses, the flaviviruses. And we know that we have some experience with individual, not necessarily pandemic pathogens in that family and see if we could develop some commonalities. Because one is not going to be that much different than the other in the same family. I just showed you that phylogenetic circle of mares, SARS-CoV-1, bat viruses, et cetera. I'll get back to that in a second. So there's going to be basic virology, assays, animal models, antigenic targets, platforms, immune correlates. If you could use that to then prioritize studying of them so that when you get an outbreak within a family, you can really hit the ground running. And that has really worked very well. Our experience with SARS-CoV-1 and with MERS, as I showed you, was very helpful in hitting the ground running with SARS-CoV-2. Lesson seven. This is critical because this is something that is very much discussed right now, if you haven't been paying attention to that. <laughs> okay. An increased attention to the human-animal in interface. Absolutely. Human health is connected to the health of animals in our shared environment. Something that's unappreciated by many, 75% of all of the emerging pathogens have been evolving from an animal host. They're called zoonotic, which means the real reservoir is in the animal, and then it jumps species. Are there any examples of that? Just a few. <laughs> Pandemic of 1918 birds, Pandemic of 2009, swine, HIV in chimps, Nipah, bats to pigs, MERS, CoV-1, 
bats to civet cats, mares uh, in, in the, the Far East, bats to camels. You can go on and on and on. And now, as we're starting to see, even though we don't know where this virus and how it emerged, if you look at the possibility, as I've written about just a little bit ago in Cell, that there's this unbalanced interaction with nature, either an encroachment on the rainforest or bringing wild animals in to a wet market and having people be in contact with animals that in the wild could have been in contact with bats, very similar to what happened with SARS-CoV-1 and MERS. There have been a couple of papers now, even though, again, you keep an open mind, you don't know what the, it is. People talk about a lab leak. People talk about a natural occurrence from the Wuhan market. Even though you keep an open mind, and it could be either one or the other, possible doesn't mean equally probable. And if you look at the data that has now been published in peer-reviewed journals in Science in August of 2020 by an international group of evolutionary virologists, the data are strongly suggesting, though not definitive, and I underline not definitive, it in fact is strongly suggestive. And then most recently, namely what came out literally at the end of March, was information that was not made available for two years. Getting back to my lesson number two about transparency, is that there were specimens that were environmental specimens from the market that showed DNA of a number of animals that should not have been there to begin with, raccoon dogs and others, that were supposedly outlawed for the wet market right there with viral RNA. Again, it doesn't definitively prove that the animals are infected, but it is quite suggestive that there may have been an animal host there. So what do we do about that? How do we reduce the risk? You expand pathogen surveillance at the interface between human and domestic animals. You know, one health that we talk about all the time, animal-human interface, stop clearing and degrading tropical and subtropical forests. There's environmental reasons for that in addition to health reasons. Improve the health and economic security of communities that live in emerging infectious disease hotspots. Enhance the biosecurity of animal husbandry. And the last one is probably the most important. Shut down or strictly regulate wildlife markets and trade. Lesson eight. We learned this painfully in other diseases, but SARS-CoV-2 shed a very bright spotlight on it. That longstanding systemic health and social inequities drive pandemic disparities. The most pervasive disparities, as we know from the greater incidence of hospitalizations and deaths among African Americans, Latino, and where we have data, American Indian, Alaska Natives, and Pacific Islanders. Why does that happen? It happens because of discrimination, limited health care access, the occupations that may put someone in a field where they can't sit behind a computer, be protected from exposure, educational income, housing, multi-generational families, but most of all, the social determinants of health. So I can give you an entire lecture on the social determinants of health, but you know what they are. It is not racial, it is just the social determinants of health, why African Americans and Hispanics to some extent have a much higher incidence of severity of disease compared to the general population because of the higher incidence of diabetes, hypertension, obesity, chronic lung disease, chronic heart disease. That's gonna take decades to correct. It's not gonna be overnight. Lesson nine, I know a little bit about this. Misinformation <laughs> is the enemy of pandemic control. And I can go through, you know, I, I could have put 150 times 10 on this slide of how misinformation and disinformation is truly the enemy of public health. I mean, if ever there was a time when we needed to be pulling together with the truth, with a common enemy, it's now, but that just continues to go on and it spills over beyond the general population. Lesson 10, my, my, my hero of my youth, Yogi Berra, who said it ain't over till it's over. Well, 
Let's talk about COVID. It ain't over till it's over. And then talk about other things that ain't over till it's over. So we try to explain, and sometimes it gets well understood in general, but sometimes not. Where are we going with COVID-19 in 2023 and beyond? Well, I think you could make it clear if you break it down into different segments. You ask yourself the question, can we eradicate SARS-CoV-2? And there's one of the few things I can say definitively, no. And why do I say no? Because we've only eradicated one single human infection in the history of public health, and that's smallpox. Why were we able to eliminate it? Multiple reasons, besides that there's a lack of an animal reservoir. Smallpox is a phenotypically stable virus. There are genetic mutations in every virus. Viruses love to have mutations. But most of the time, they stay phenotypically stable. Smallpox that killed some of the Egyptian pharaohs is the same smallpox that we eradicated in 1980. The vaccination campaign. But importantly, the durability of vaccine and infection-induced immunity is measured minimally in decades and optimally for a lifetime. So then ask the next question, can we eliminate it? What does eliminate it mean? It's no longer in certain regions of the world. It's no longer in the United States or in the European Union. Let's take a look at what we've eliminated. In the United States, we've eliminated polio and we've eliminated measles. So let's look at the characteristic of that virus and those viruses. One, they're both phenotypically stable. I was infected with measles when I was a child because, in case you haven't noticed, I'm old enough to actually have gotten measles because the vaccine wasn't available. That's exactly the same measles that's infecting children in Pakistan and in Afghanistan. It's phenotypically stable. Next, we know that if you either get infected with measles or you get vaccinated with measles, that the durability of your protection is measured minimally in decades and optimally for a lifetime. And you have a very well accepted national vaccination campaign. Most of the time, you can't go to school until you get measles vaccine. Now let's look at the subject of today's talk, SARS-CoV-2. As I've showed you on lesson number one, this is a very, very diverse virus. It is a SARS-CoV-2, but genotypically and phenotypically, we've had five variants that have caused spikes throughout the world. Do we have a lack, do we have a widely accepted vaccination campaign? No. 69% of our population is vaccinated. We're way down in rank in the world. And less than 20% of the eligible people have received the bivalent BA45 boost. What about immunity? We all know that the immunity against infection wanes in a matter of months, and immunity against severe disease hangs in there a bit longer but it's not measured in years. We don't know if it's decades yet, but I can tell you it isn't decades because you know you're gonna need a boost very likely. The FDA has already decided that soon they will be saying, I, I read this literally today, that they are fact going to very likely recommend that there's a springtime boost for people who are immunocompromised and elderly. Now, what do we want then? Control. That is feasible and doable, and that's what we want. We want to get control. Some people call it endemicity. Some people call it back to normalcy, namely similar to other viruses, though we like it all to go away, but it's not going to go away. We want to get it down to a low enough level that it doesn't interfere with the social order. It doesn't interfere where you're getting anxious when you go into a restaurant or when you have a person in your family that's immune compromised, you get nervous when you go out to dinner. That's getting back to normal, namely low enough level that it's not a threat. And how do you do that? And I think we know how to do that. You have interventions. You may need to intermittently vaccinate, a la what the FDA is already talking about. The availability of therapies, monoclonal antibodies, and antivirals, so that if you do get someone who, in fact, is a susceptible person because of age, 
or immune compromise or what have you, that that person could be protected. So it is doable. So finally, beyond COVID. I wrote this article three months ago in the New England Journal of Medicine, and again, I borrowed it tongue in cheek from my pal, Yogi Berra. And I said, it ain't over till it's over, but it's never over. And what I mean by that is that when you're dealing with emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases, they have been here before recorded history. We in our lifetimes have lived through several outbreaks of pandemic potential and reality already, and they will be here long after we are gone. So as I said, this is a map that I keep showing. I see Bapa there, I show this to the Georgetown, excuse me, the GW uh, class, first year medical school class, every time, and I don't know how many years I've been doing that, and I keep showing them that every year I, I'm running out of space on the slide, so the GW students look at this and say, my God, what is the next one gonna be? And that's the answer, that's the question. We don't know what the next one is gonna be. So as you see what we've experienced over the last couple of years, the outbreaks in US and multiple other countries are on the left. The outbreaks outside of the United States. What is this map and this two year cycle telling us? It's telling us something that I show in the last slide of what I wrote about now, fifth, but I guess you know, 15 years ago or so, emerging infections, without a doubt, if you can't appreciate that based on what I've been saying, then you haven't been paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> it's a perpetual challenge. And the only way you meet a perpetual challenge is by being perpetually prepared. And that's the lesson of COVID-19. Thank you. Okay, well, as you might imagine, we have a few questions that were submitted ahead of time by members of our community, especially students, and I'm going to get through as many of them as I can, um, Tony, but um, okay. uh, you address some of their questions. But I, I, I'm going to start out with um, one that I think um, many of us are curious about, which is, you know, at, especially after going through the pandemic and those of us in medicine and public health, um, many of us experienced days that were very exhausting, burnout maybe. We watched you. We watched you staying aligned to purpose, your values, the science, um, appearing at least on television to be energetic. <laughs> and so the question, and this is from Zoe Mapufo, one of our students, what is your secret for keeping aligned to your purpose and values as you're going through turbulence, even criticism, um, and even resistance to your advice? Well, that's, that, thank you, Lynn. That, that's a frequently uh, asked question, which is an appropriate question. Um, and, and what I find is, is I think one of, the, one of the most important solutions is I focus like a laser beam on what my mission is and what my job is and what my goal is. And that, despite the craziness that surrounds all of this, because we're living in a really unusual situation of misinformation and disinformation, is focus like a laser beam on what your job is. And your job, my job, as a scientist, a physician, and a public health individual, is to preserve and protect the health of the American public and indirectly of the entire world, because the United States is an example for the rest of the world. And it's amazing if you focus like a laser beam, everything else is noise. And if you treat it as noise, you don't get distracted. If you give into it and, and get, it's more exhausting to worry about the craziness than it is to stay up late at night trying to read an article to keep up with what you need to know. So if you get rid of that other stuff, uh, that's the way I, I appear to be energetic, <laughs> but, there's, 
there, there's another very important thing because sometimes it, it does escape from you. In the first three months of the outbreak in January, February, and March, I did something stupid. I violated some of my own health rules. Like I was getting three and four hours of sleep a night and I, and I was forgetting to drink water and, and eat. Um, so it was a very wise consultant that I had, my wife, uh, <laughs> who essentially said, time out. You're gonna sleep and you're gonna drink you know, a couple of bottles of water a day. And then I realized that it, it, this is a marathon. So right around March, I realized that this was not a, a 10K. It was, it was a marathon. And I realized I needed to pace myself. So that was the, that was the secret. Thank you for that. So actually, two students, uh, one, um, Hannah Silverman, and the other one, Judy Silverstein Gray, both are asking about um, a similar issue, and you alluded to it, and that is the public's trust in science, which I think Hannah um, indicated maybe has been lost in the last several years. I would say in my um, long career, I think I've seen many areas where there has been a lack of trust in science by the public. But, um, but how do we approach um, um, either loss of, of trust or even anti-science um, attitudes that have become pervasive? And, and, I, and I think something perhaps more unusual in, the re, in, in recent times among leadership um, and, and our government as well at, at state and federal levels. What, what can we do about it? Well, let me address the science question because that's something that you know, all of us as scientists or would-be scientists have, have to deal with, um, is that it's a com First of all, if there was an easy answer, I could say, oh yes, here's the answer, and we'll go on to the next question. But, <laughs> but we, we could spend hours, if not weeks, and entire courses in your, in your school about that, is that um, it's a combination of an understandable, and I don't mean this in a, in a, in a negatively critical way, of somewhat of a bit of science illiteracy in this country where people don't understand the nature of science, certainly not the nature of the biological sciences. Number two is that the people, we are living in a very disturbing arena of misinformation and disinformation where untruths become normalized, where there's so much lying going on and, and no consequence of lying where you accept it. You know, years and years ago, even when there was some degree of anti-science, if somebody said something that was outlandishly false, they would be shamed and they would be sort of out. Now, people do it and it's okay. In fact, it may be, I mean, we have somebody in Congress who's lied their way through everything and the guy is still there and they haven't thrown him out yet. I mean, But he's very well dressed. He's well, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, to me, I think that's, that, that's really a, a classic example. Um, and, and I also think that we need to explain better. It's, all, it's part of us. We need more scientists and more public health people communicating. And I know when you're working hard, particularly at a younger stage in your career, you have a lot of things to do. You don't want to be bothered with so-called communicating, and sometimes you're a little shy about it. The only trouble is the people who are communicating misinformation and disinformation, I believe are a relatively small fraction, but they're very energetic, speaking of energy, and it's almost like they don't have a day job, whereas the people <laughs> who have something to do that's productive don't have the time to be spending five hours a day tweeting nonsense. They, 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 they're working, they're, they're on call, or they're studying for an exam. Um, and, 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 and that really makes it very, very difficult. And, and the other final thing is, I know this is a bit of a long-winded answer, but it's such an important question, is that we need to explain better that when you're dealing with a moving target, that health officials and scientists and physicians, many of whom are scientists, are asked to give an advice or a recommendation at this point in time when the information you have is related to this point in time. Now, if this were a static problem, that this would be the same as this. But when you have a moving target, and I just showed you, you know the stepwise thing with the virus doing that, escaping immunity, multiple, that was a moving target. So when people asked us, you know, 
what would you do with a virus that doesn't transmit so well? Well, you know, I wouldn't do necessarily much different, but just keep an eye out on it. But if you knew that the virus was one that was transmitted by, by mostly 50 to 60 percent asymptomatic, you would have a much, much different way of recommending what you would do. But the general public, I think, doesn't appreciate that because they believe science is science and science is exact. And the analogy I give is that it isn't math that we're dealing with, it's biology. So in January of 2020, 2 plus 2 equals 4. In April of 2023, 2 plus 2 still equals 4. In January of 2020, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is a much different virus than it is in April of 2023. And it's changed, it's evaded monoclonal antibodies, it's evaded vaccine-induced protection. It is either more or less virulent, it's a moving target. In fairness to the general public, it's very difficult for them to really understand that when they think science is all exact, but it isn't. Well, it doesn't help if they've been taught that evolution doesn't exist, so I think that's a problem. Uh -huh. But um, <laughs> I have a question, and it's, it's from a, actually a colleague, um, Richard Burson, who's on our faculty and I think also has worked at the NIH. And I, I would have to say, uh, this is an easier question, in all the years that you spent at the NIH, what is the one thing of which you are the most proud? I would find that would be a difficult question myself, but. No, I mean, uh, I, I, again, that, these questions are, are relevant questions and they get asked a lot. I've had the privilege, unusual mostly, I mean, how many people have been in a job for 54 years? Um, so I've had three separate hats that I've had the privilege to wear. One is a scientist and a clinician. The other one is as the director of a very large institute that funds or conducts most of the infectious disease research in the country and in some respects in the world. And the other one is the privilege in my position as director of getting involved in policy, which was not what you're originally trained for, and having the ability and the opportunity to advise seven presidents. So if you look at each one of those hats, I think the research that I did early on in my career before HIV, when we were developing rather uh, effective therapy for autoimmune diseases, that I think changed the whole complexion of how you treat autoimmune diseases. Nobody knows about that, except people who are old enough to know about that. <laughs> and there are not a lot of people who know that. because I did it in 1968, 69, 70, 71. So how many people in this room were born then? Um, some of them were in kindergarten, but. I know, I know <laughs> Dean Bass was, because she's 200 years old. Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> but um, then the next one was HIV, where I spent 40 years working on the pathogenic mechanisms of HIV, many of which led to understanding of the kinds of therapy that could be used. So that was hat number one. The other was as director of, of the NIAID, when I, when I established and created the AIDS program, which really completely transformed how we look at HIV and led to the discovery together in partnership with the pharmaceutical companies, the combination of therapies that clearly have saved millions of lives. And that came from the program that we established. So I obviously have to feel very good about that. And another one was somewhat accidental in that my dealing with different presidents allowed me to develop relationships with them, one of which George W. Bush, who essentially commissioned me in our desire, our mutual desire, to address people in the developing world who were unnecessarily dying from HIV because they didn't have access to drugs, to prevention, to care. And he asked me to, and I did, became the architect of the PEPFAR program, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which as we know, we had a, in Washington, we had a 20 year anniversary celebration downtown. And we celebrated the fact that over that 20 year period, 25 million lives were saved. So I think you have to kind of feel good about that. I, I would say there are people in this room who are living with autoimmune diseases and HIV who are alive today because of the work that you did at NIH. I thank you for that. So a question from Ella Flowers. Um, 
she, her concern is how we were able or not able to collect real time data um, about public health during COVID. And if there was one thing you could change about what kind of information was available to you on a daily basis, what that would be. Yeah. I feel awkward in saying I spoke about the great scientific successes of COVID, the great, the great failures, unfortunately, saying this in a school of public health, was public health. I mean, we failed at, the, at public health, and we didn't fail because we didn't have good people. We have really, really good people, many of them here in this organization. We failed because our, our system of collecting data in real time is non-existent. And the reason you know it non-existent, it was very humbling because I hope the CDC is gonna change. They need the resources to do it. Thank goodness Rochelle Walensky realizes that and she's trying to transform that organization. But the data that we get is usually two to three months late. And I, we, myself and, and the people in the COVID team, it was somewhat humbling in order to get real time data of what was going on we had to get on the phone with our colleagues in Israel, in the UK, and in South Africa, who had a system because their healthcare system was intimately entwined with their public health system. So that any time somebody went into an emergency room or went to see a doctor and got a COVID test or got a diagnosis, that immediately went into a database. Mm -hmm. So you could get on the phone with our South African colleagues and say, what is the real time uh, prevalence of this new isolate called Omicron? They could tell you within the last week what it was, and we had to wait literally for months to find that out. That's the thing that needs to, well, you know that better than I, Lynn. Well, that I'm, needs I'm working to, with the CDC, Dr. Walensky, right. in, the con, in the context of her advisory committee, and I mean, we do have these um, electronic health record databases that don't talk to each other and don't talk to public health. And, and a lot of things are entered and a lot of people in healthcare put a lot of effort into it, but it does not get interconnected in a way that is meaningful for real-time data for public right. health. It's really an, an amazing thing. Um, two of the students, and so this is kind of connected, two of the students, um, Michael Chang and Carolyn Brown Kaiser, um, are concerned about the fact that public health received a lot of attention during the pandemic. And then, uh, frankly, um, some people uh, uh, got a little tired of it, quit talking about it. How do we keep the focus on the public health system? The fact that we have such a poor um, data collection system is not because the people in the system don't understand that they needs to be done. There's a lack of resources. I was telling you about how um, where you work in uh, Montgomery County, they were exchanging data by fax when we first went in there in early 2020, which is crazy, right? Um, home of the NIH. Um, but how do, we, how do we bring public health forward on the policy agenda? How do we get focus on that, um, you know, especially in this era? Um, well, it's gotta, be, it's gotta be strong advocacy. The, one of the things that I've, you know, th the benefits, uh, if you want to call it a benefit, of having been in the field for so long is that you see um, the corporate memory of a, an acute challenge is very short-lived, uh, unfortunately. And the only way to keep it going is to put the energy, the communication, and the advocacy to not let people forget that we are, we've just lived through, and it isn't over yet, apropos of lesson number 10. I memorize all those lessons. You know? <laughs> uh, uh, is that it, it isn't over. And um, we, what better lesson can our civilization get to have the worst killer pandemic that we've had in over 100 years? Uh, we've got to keep the advocacy up. You know, and we also need to go back and rekindle advocacy. One of the, my great concerns, since I've spent, you know, 42 years of my life with HIV, is that everybody, you know, kind of figures, well, HIV is where we want it. No, 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 no. There's still a lot of people getting infected throughout the world. There's still lack of access to drugs. We need to put much more money 
into developing better user-friendly regimens. We've done well with long-acting prep and long-acting treatment, but we've got to continue to do better. You know, we had an aspirational goal of ending HIV by 2030. We shouldn't give up that goal. And if you don't give up the goal, you've got to make sure we get more resources in that. So you've got to just, you've got to keep pushing. You can't, things don't happen spontaneously or automatically in Washington, except taxes and things like that. But um, <laughs> what hearings. you- Hearings. Yeah, yeah, hearings, yeah. All right, all right. Well, I think HIV, if you had had it up on one, on one of those slides, it's definitely a virus that's fairly stable. Right. And we have found, at, you know, through RCFAR and the other ones across the country, we can engage the community that has the virus, and we can do preventive actions um, with with medication, but we don't yet have the vaccine. And I'm so really proud that you know George Washington University is a part, you know, of the HIV vaccine clinical trials network across the country. That is just still such an important goal right. to be able to immunize people. Um, so from Rebecca Prisco, and actually there were a lot, of, a lot of questions that were variants of this one, but we have many people who are going to be graduating with their Masters of Public Health in May. Uh, our school alone, it's hundreds across the country, many hundreds more. And what would be your advice for MPH graduates, especially those who are aspiring to go into global health or go into the infectious diseases control um, world? Yeah, I, I mentioned that to a few of the students that we took that picture with together, but there's, there were only just a few of them, so why don't I just kind of repeat it a bit? And I found this very uh, relevant to my own career, is, and that is to, that at your stage of training, you are, if not toady potential, you are certainly pluripotential which means that you can actually do anything you want to do. And what you need to do is to pick out an area that you're passionate about, not one that looks kind of nice because people think it's important or because your mother or your father or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your husband or your wife think it's important. Pick it out because you're really passionate about it. And you'll know it. It's really a gut reaction. You analyze things with your mind intellectually, but when you're about to make a decision, ask yourself what your gut thinks. And the reason I say that is that unless you're passionate about what you're doing, A, you're not gonna be very good at it, no matter how talented you are. Well, you may be good at it, but you won't be optimal to your potential. Of course, a lot of people are good at things that they don't like, <laughs> but you can really be great at something that you like. That's the first thing. The second thing, it's gonna be hard work. I mean, anybody who does something that's contributory, it isn't easy. And if you're gonna do hard work, you really have to be really committed to it. And I gave the analogy, and I, it was kind of, people were laughing, but it's true. You'll know it when you feel it. It's kind of like, you know, falling in love. <laughs> you know, you go out and you date five or six people. They're okay, but you're not in love. And then you meet somebody, bang, it's like, whoa. <laughs> that, that's, that's what, to me, uh, feeling your gut reaction is. So you got to fall in love with what you're doing. I mean, I would say that people come into public health for love, not money. It doesn't really pay all that well. So, you know, <laughs> right. A priori, we have, a, we have people who are so motivated. You, you mentioned earlier, as you work with other countries, that their health systems are aligned, prevention, public health, and health care. And ours is not. And how do you see that evolving? In this country, the relationship between public health and medicine and, you know, given, and of course, our system is very complicated. It's not really a system, but. Um, well, we have something in this country that many of the other countries, whether they're poorer, none of them are richer, but depending on how less rich they are, um, uh, you know, don't have the disparities that we have. We have extraordinary health disparities in this country. And when you have a degree of disparities where you have unequal access to and unequal capability of responding to, then your health system uh, is not gonna be as good as it could be. And I think everybody agrees that the health system in this country uh, is, can, can use improvement. I'm, I'm really trying to uh, sort of me measure my words because 
You're talking about misinformation and disinformation, my iPhone will explode if I say something that disturbs some nutcake out there. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, that is one of our problems, though. I mean, I, I think not just somebody out there might be disturbed, but also the potential for almost an automatic set of responses to happen. And we were talking about that a little earlier, about how uh, negativity on the internet gets magnified so quickly because there seem to be, and I've experienced it myself, these bots that as soon as they pick up something negative, automatically amplify yeah. it. You know, it's just, and it can't possibly be actually, because it's going to be hundreds of them yeah. all at once. Um, actually, Lynn, the, 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 on a very serious note, and that's something that when you talk about the students and people who are young in, in their career, uh, it is a reality. I know this because I've been told this a hundred times by my experienced, uh, well-established public health and scientific colleagues that they may say something that's absolutely true and about public health, like, you know, you really need to go out and get vaccination because vaccines, they are safe. They don't cause you to get magnetized and Tony Fauci didn't put a chip in it with Bill <laughs> Gates and it can save your life. And that literally within minutes, they get 50 threatening emails about not only you know, very obscene, threatening things, but, but even things of threatening violence against them. And you have these public health officials say, what do I need this for? I'm not gonna speak out about public health. That's a really diabolical, clever way to get the misinformation, disinformation be more prevalent than the correct information, is try and intimidate the people who are putting out the correct information. So I know it's not easy when you go home and you get beep, 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 and you just you know, and they say, oh my God, is somebody really I'm telling me this? I'm gonna make sure my children don't see that. But that's the reality, but you can't back down. I mean, if you back down and then they've won, and they've won, and that's an unfortunate state of affairs. Absolutely the case, and, but I, I do think that uh, for young people beginning their careers to participate in the dialogue is important, but also to be thoughtful about what you tweet and right. post. Um, if you're feeling particularly wild at that moment, it may not be the right moment to post. <laughs> Take a minute to cool down and think, think it well, through. You know, but it gets, do post, don't, you know, don't it, sit there and, you know, but. It gets back to my answer to one of your prior questions, Lynn, is focus on what you're doing and the rest is noise, okay? Mm -hmm. That's noise, just put it aside, it's noise. So I mentioned in, in my introduction to you the, the people you have mentored over the years, uh, which is, I, I, know, I know many of them. You probably don't realize that, but a succession of people have gone through from the day that you were a laboratory chief onward that, and whose careers you have um, impacted. But this question from Kimberly Woodward is that as you think back on your own life, is there a person or are there people who were particularly critical to the development of your own career as you look back? Yeah, there are several. There's one in particular who recruited me to the NIH and made a, you know, a major impact on my career because I likely would not be in my position right now had I not had that person in my life. His name was Sheldon Wolf. He was the clinical director of the... Uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And when I was a uh, intern at the New York Hospital Cornell Medical Center, and we had to apply for you know, different positions in the Navy, the Army, the Air Force, or the Public Health Service, he recruited me to come down to be an NIAID um, to try a, a career in research. And as I've told some of the students, my plan was to go down to the NIH, spend three years in a fellowship and get back to New York Hospital and practice medicine on 2nd Avenue and 72nd Street uh, and, and essentially be a, a noble profession of just being a private physician out of a hospital, out of a big teaching hospital in New York. And he convinced me after spending three years as a fellow 
that he said, I think you can probably be a really good basic and clinical researcher, and why don't you come down here and see your patients in a research hospital as opposed in, to a private hospital? And I went down there, and the three years with him as my mentor completely changed my attitude of what I wanted to do. And that's the reason why I stayed in, in research and didn't go back into private practice. Well, if I can ask, given your, your job, you're not a professor, like a lot of people in the room. You don't um, need you know, course evaluations you know, to support your career. And yet you have put a lot of your time and energy both into mentoring, helping to develop the careers of, uh, of younger people. And also you come and you, you do, I think, regularly talk to our first year medical students and have interactions with other students. Why do you give that back? What do you get out of that? Enormous satisfaction and gratification. Um, the way I look at it, that if you're, if you're a basic researcher and you do, or a clinical researcher, and you do an experiment, that's a really great experiment, it gets peer reviewed and it gets published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And hundreds of thousands of people um, read the New England Journal of Medicine. So you've had an impact on how many, many people are thinking about disease. There's another way to disseminate what you do, and that is train a large number of people who will go out and train people who will train people who will train people. You know, I'm looking at one right now, uh, Bopper, uh, yes. Deaton, who was a trainee of mine years and years and years ago. And look at all the students, some in this room, that have benefited from BAPA. So even though I have not essentially trained every one of those young students, there's a little bit of Tony Fauci in them, I think, because, <laughs> because BAPA you know, remembers what I taught him when he broke into my office in a snowstorm and said, I want to work for you. <laughs> So uh, a, a couple of questions, and I'm being told, uh, do I have five? Just asking. One? OK, then I'm going <laughs> to do the last one. And from Shanzita Alam, what does life after COVID look like for you? And I think you've already told us that we're not actually, we don't actually have COVID in our rearview mirror, not really. But I think moving forward and retired, what does it look like for you? Well, you know, it, it, it depends. It depends on what you mean by retired. Uh, <laughs> We're not observing that you're particularly No, retired. I'm not. I mean, I'm, I've certainly stepped down from uh, working at the federal government level uh, because I've done that for 54 years, and I, and I made a decision about a year ago that in the remaining years, while I still have you know, energy and passion and new ideas and, thank goodness, good health, I want to be able to do something outside of the confines of the federal government that might allow me to express myself in different ways. Uh, you know, but the, with the goal being, I want to do it uh, by what I have to offer to society. And one of the things is the benefit of my experience, which is this, you know, quite extensive. I've been the director of the institute for 38 years. And by doing that is to hopefully uh, inspiring young people to go into medicine, to go into science, and to go into public health. And you can do that by so many different ways. You can do that by lecturing, well, aha, today. You can do that by writing. Um, I have a couple of papers that are going to be coming out in some of the high-ranked journals in the next month or so. You could do it by associating with a university and teaching. You could do it by writing a memoir. There are many ways of doing that. So. When you say retire, Lynn, it's not that I'm not going to be doing what I like to do. It's just I'm not going to be doing it on the seventh floor of Building 31 at the NIH. And you'll have academic freedom. You can yeah. say what you want. Yes, so. exactly. <laughs> it's been wonderful to have you. I know that we're going to do a little um, um, token of appreciation for you. Um, oh, gee. You can hold it. Um, My goodness. We. Um, this is uh, hopefully a memento for you, Thank of, you. Our, um, of our um, time together today. Um, a, com a completely unique plaque. Um, <laughs> Thank you. The this Milken is Institute School of Public Health baseball bat, um, you know, with multiple signatures. Um, thank you. But anyway, thank you. Well, thank you. And guess what? I can keep it. <laughs> you can keep it. <laughs>
It might be worth more than $25. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great. Thank if you. all of our guests could please remain seated in the auditorium while Dr. Fauci leaves, thank you so much. Should we give yes. you our mics? I'll take them when we 